I, I came to the electric universe theory and the thunderbolts through uh, Anthony Peratt. I stumbled into a television program where he was portraying his plasma simulations producing the instabilities like the squatter man instability and comparing those to Patrick Bliss. And I, I grew up here in the Southwest and I'm familiar with Patrick Bliss. I've seen squatter man and rocks right here in the mountains. And I've always been curious about these strange figures in the rocks. And uh, so it caught my curiosity. And I also have a background in engineering and worked in the power industry for 30 years. So I'm pretty familiar with electricity and I could understand that what Dr. Peratt was showing was a real physical electromagnetic influence that undeniably was what was being portrayed in the rocks. The connection was obvious to me and the physics behind it was understandable. So that's what brought me into the, the whole idea of Electric Universe and I started digging deeper and ran into Thunderbolts.info and Walt Thornhill and David Talbot and started reading the work on there and the, in the Space News and all the other material and things just started falling into place like pieces of a puzzle. How, why the large scale structure of the universe is the way it is, and how Birkeland currents work, and the currents through space, and the formation of galaxies, and galactic clusters, all these things started making sense. I'm not an astronomer, I, I am an engineer, and <clears throat> I have a little bit of smattering of a geologic background, and, and I have a, a, a huge interest in the landscape and landforms, and in particular mountains. So growing up here in the Southwest, I've, I've been in, 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 in it and in, in living in it all my life. And uh, I've had an undying curiosity about it. So I, I stumbled into Michael Steinbacher's work, of course, in the context of the electric universe and started watching some of his videos. And they really captured my attention. In fact, he talked about these mountains that are to the north of me that I grew up under the shadow of the Catalina Mountains. He did an episode called The Majestic Catalinas. And he talked about these mountains being windblown forms, windblown dunes. And I realized that's exactly what I'd been seeing all my life. And, uh, and that this windblown formation of the mountains, he was right about. <clears throat> but I didn't quite understand how that connected with EU theory. The way I look at EU theory is you kind of have to accept the, what I call the Holy Trinity as the primary influence in everything that we see. And that Holy Trinity is electricity, magnetism, and dielectricity. And you realize what those influences do and how they influence space and matter and energy. And you have to look for patterns that, that those influences would create. So that's what I started looking for. And I started realizing that these windblown mountain features displayed features that I recognized from my experience in engineering. And these were shock features. Uh, uh, shock features that, that, uh, that imprint the landscape with these what I call triangular buttresses. And they're all over mountain sides. And they are caused by supersonic winds creating standing shock waves. And the imprint of those shockwaves can be seen. And I recognize that. So I called this theory Arc Blast, and I presented it last year at the EU conference. And uh, have written several articles describing the details and particulars and the physics behind the shockwave theory. And uh, from the last year's conference, I also met up with uh, Bruce Laborn, who's also interested in Earth geology. And he's a geologist himself. He's also an oceanographer who's been a, a career in the Navy looking at magnetic anomalies in the seafloor and, and working with uh, magnetometers and surveys. And he had a, a, a great depth of understanding about the interior workings of the Earth in, in, in regard to its magnetic field. So we got together, and it, and it seemed like our, there was a way that our different theories probably dovetailed, but it wasn't obvious how. And so we got together and went on an extended camping trip in Utah and started looking at some of these features, some of these triangular buttresses formed on monoclines at the San Rafael Reef and at uh, Comb Ridge in northern Arizona, and 
capital reef in Utah. We look at the San Rafael Swell, and we look at Canyonlands and Arches National Monument, and several of these, these strange features in the southwest on the Colorado Plateau. Um, and we started trying to unravel what the story was behind them, the physics behind what would make them. And with this knowledge about shock waves, I went back and started mapping the wind patterns. I made a wind map based on the shock wave patterns that I saw in the mountains, because it portrays the direction of the wind that created the mountain, right? It's like a dune, and you can tell which direction the wind was blowing to have created that dune. So I traced all this out on a map and made a wind map, and sure enough, a very coherent picture emerged of uh, these wind patterns. And then we started peeling through the layers of other features, because wind doesn't explain every feature on the landscape, but it does display, it does explain some of them. We started looking at the other features that were not wind form, they were, but they were very electrical in nature, and started piecing together what caused them looking at features that were caused by arcs, fulgamite and fulgurite type features, karse, buttes, um, mountain forms. And as we layered these things in, and then we looked at volcanoes and the pattern of volcanism all across the landscape, and, and the picture just kept filling in. It was the same coherent picture with ever and ever greater levels of detail. And what has emerged from that is a very coherent picture of how North America was formed. Electrically, the physics behind it, I believe we can explain to a great level of depth how this occurred and what phenomena took place to make it happen. And by looking at North America, then we can infer to the other continents. And so I think we have an explanation that's in the works right now. It's my job is to turn it into language and writing and imagery that conveys the message. But I think once we get it out here in the very near future, people have that chance to look at it. I think it's going to be, uh, gee, I should have thought of that. It's going to be so obvious and coherent and simple that, that it will be easy to understand even for a 10-year-old. And. Uh, so I'm very excited about that, but there's a lot of work to get from the point of describing all this stuff and, and, and putting it together with the imagery and the words to, to convey the message to everybody in a comprehensive way. Um, but I know that what we're finding is true. And the reason I know that is because these patterns that are on the landscape that we'll describe in great detail, but the patterns that form are fractal in nature. They repeat over and over. And when you have a, a repetitive pattern that repeats on different scales, well, two or three times that might happen, and you can call it a coincidence. But when it happens five-fold or six-fold or seven-fold times over different scales that span orders of magnitude, and it's the same pattern influenced by the same explainable electromagnetic forces, dielectricity, electricity, and magnetism, then a coherent picture emerges that uh, that's what we have. That's what I'll show. And that's why I know it's, it's right, because those repeating fractal patterns, nature doesn't do that for just no reason. It's not just some magical thing. It's electricity. It's the only thing that does that. And that's when we know that's what it is. So I can't wait to show it to everybody and uh, hear their excitement.